Good morning, everyone. Welcome back to OCAM. All right, so we're going to try and add one one more chapter before we before we take our midterm. Um, a reminder that the midterm will be open a week from today, and it'll be due a week from Sunday. Um, so you'll have one more quiz this weekend. And then actually, I think uh, what I might do is uh, instead of doing quiz, have you do um, a practice test as, a, as an assignment instead of a quiz this week. Um, so uh, I will make that available to you all in um, after uh, lectures over today. Um, we're taking our test. The timing falls a little differently than last year. Um, I think partly due to to us being more used to being on Zoom, and partly just because of the the way the timing fell. Because um, so we'll I have to um, rewrite the practice test a little bit from last year because we're actually going to get one more chapter in um, than they did. So we will continue on here, and so we're going to start talking about carboxylic acids, which go along with aldehydes and ketones um, in that they're carbonyl compounds. The difference is that with the class two carbonyls, the aldehydes and the ketones, we didn't have a good leaving group. Um, so when we reacted those, they predominantly went through that nucleophilic addition. Um, carboxylic acids and their derivatives, on the other hand, the, they have a good leaving group attached to the carbonyl. So when you, the first step for a lot of these reactions is going to look similar to the nucleophilic addition. Um, but the second step is that you're, that a leaving group leaves and you add and you reform the carbonyl bond. So it winds up being a form of, of substitution um, where you're swapping out one good leaving group for another good leaving group, um, which is why these have their own category. Um, I assume I s everybody was in lab almost the whole time on on Tuesday and uh, didn't have too much in the way of of questions by the end. Is everybody making progress on those synthesis problems? Hopefully. Any questions on them so far? All right, if you want to, if you think of any, you can always ask during break or after break. We can, we can talk about them then, since I'm sort of springing this on you. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about carboxylic acids. Um, and we know what the, what the functional group is for carboxylic acids at this point. Um, it's that carbonyl with an OH attached to it. Hang on, I'm trying to get my. No, that'll just have to work. All right. So the um, you know, one of the simplest carboxylic acids. Um, is one of the most common as well. Acetic acid, vinegar. Um, it's what the the acidity in it is what gives vinegar that sort of. Um, if you smell vinegar, it kind of gives you that stinging sensation in your nose, especially if it's if it's white vinegar or um, distilled vinegar. Um, that's that's the acid acetic acid actually has a boiling point that's just above that of water. It's I want to say it's a 120 Celsius. Um, so it does actually evaporate pretty um, pretty easily compared to some of these others, and that that means when it Redissolves in your mucous membranes, um, it can change the pH, and so you can wind up with with it singing your eyes. You can wind up with it kind of singing your nose a little bit, um, especially if you're using the concentrated form, which is called um, glacial acetic acid. It's like the most the strongest vinegar smell you've ever smelled in your life, um, and it does really hurt your nose if you if you get a, a good whiff of it. 
Um, in general, these acid compounds are not typically um, pleasant. Um, probably that's that's a evolutionary response to um, food that has been partially oxidized um, is going to have tend to have a lot of carboxylic acids in it. And if it's been partially oxidized, it's not fresh. Um, there's probably microbes living in it that are oxidizing some of the compounds. Um, so butanoic acid it smells like bad butter. Um, hexanoic acid, lactic acid. Um, they're, like I said, not particularly pleasant. Acetic acid is really the only one that we actually use in cooking. Um, that said, there are lots of acid groups in um, in pharmaceuticals, and so we see them present on a, on a lot of of uh, drugs and chemicals um, that are used for, um, especially treatment of um, skin conditions. Um, I'm not sure if that has to do with them drying out skin more or or just changing the pH, or if it's just a common common thing to keep them from evaporating too quickly. Cosmetic vitamin C, yeah, vitamin C is is uh, an acid. Actually, a lot of when you think of it. Um, I think about half of the B vitamins and vitamin C are also acids. Um, partly because those also play roles as um intermediates in Krebs cycle or in citric the citric acid cycle um, because that's they're sort of the one step removed from fully a fully oxidized carbon remember that decarboxylation step um, that we see sometimes is when you can wind up with the acid group it can be converted into a co2 molecule sometimes just by applying heat and so that's most of the um, steps in the citric acid cycle that produce NADH or um, FADH2, so some of the high energy electron carriers. Um, if I'm remembering properly, most of those steps are decarboxylation steps where you're taking an acid group and removing it from, um, from one of the, the chemicals in the citric acid cycle. <coughs> hmm. So, common names for um, benzoic acids are pretty common, um, especially in biological contexts. For instance, citric acid is also known as tricarboxylic acid because it's got three acid groups on the same molecule. Um, but in general, we're going to name these just like we'd be naming an aldehyde. They're always going to be at the end of a carbon chain um, by the nature of the fact that carbon, the acid carbon, has to have three of its four bonds tied up in, in oxygen bonds. Um, so we name it just like an aldehyde. You just drop the end of the alkane name and add oic acid. So um, pentane becomes pentanoic acid. Um, and we name whatever else we have around as a branch, as a, as a prefix. Um, so in cases of more complicated molecules like um, this one to the right here, um, we actually wind up naming some functional groups that normally would be, we would name with a suffix that we would normally name as the most important functional group. Um, kind of carboxylic acids kind of take priority. So we're gonna name it as a carboxylic acid and then name that OH group um, with a prefix. We just use, use the prefix hydroxy for an OH group. Um, and even, even carboxylic acids, are, that's not the end of our priority when it comes to these functional groups. There are other functional groups that are more, more important than carboxylic acids. Or if we wanted to um, add an acid group to a common molecule, we could actually name an acid group with a carboxy is actually the prefix you use to indicate an acid group. Um, the most common common names that we see are formic acid and acetic acid. Um, F-O-R-M, form, um, is the old way of saying meth when it comes to, to a prefix. So 
formal anything. Um, formaldehyde, formic acid means single carbon. Um, propionic acid sounds a lot like propanoic acid. So they're spelled differently, but nobody's going to really know the difference. And if you read propionic acid, just know that it's the same as propanoic acid and same with butyric and butanoic. Um, and then and benzoic acid technically is not an IUPAC name, um, but it's pretty easy to figure out what you're talking about, right? Just like um, benzaldehyde, benzoic acid is an acid group attached to benzene. Uh, if we have any, if we have a deprotonated acid, if we have a, an acid that's already acted as the acid and given up its proton, um, we just drop the ick in the acid and we just name it um, right as eight. So acetic acid becomes acetate. Butanoic acid becomes butanoate, which is a little bit of a mouthful look at, but uh, when you write it out, it makes sense. So butanoic acid would be when it's deprotonated, would be butanoate. And so this actually follows our, our nomenclature for naming acids back from Gen Chem, right? Back in Gen Chem, if we named it according to what the polyatomic ion was, we said anything that ended in an ick or ended in an eight, we turned that into ick. So nitrate became nitric acid, right? Sulfate became sulfuric acid, phosphate became phosphoric acid. We're basically doing the same thing here just with carboxylic acids. So formic acid would become formate. Um, interesting note about formic acid. I might have mentioned this before. Um, formic acid is actually um, one of the first carboxylic acids that was ever really discovered. Uh, it was discovered by some of the ancient Greeks, and form formic actually are uh, is it formic? Uh, it means um, it's related to the same root as ants because the first place they discovered formic acid was actually, it's inside ants, inside ants carapace. They have, um, they don't have blood, they have formic acid. They don't have blood because they don't have oxygen transport that works the same way we do, right? Insects just have holes in their body that allow oxygen to get inside of their body. Um, and so ants um, have, this, have this basically formic acid soup inside of them that their that their organs are suspended in. Um, and so that's why formic acid is formica. That's what it is. Formica is the Greek word for ants. So formic acid means coming from ants. Um, and if you've ever if you've ever had an ant problem and squished a whole bunch of them in your, you know, in your kitchen or something at once, um, that you know, ants have that really sort of sweetish kind of chemically smell when you squish them. That's the smell of formic acid. All right. So then we have a slide on. All right, so if we have a dicarboxylic acid, just like when any other of our other functional groups that we have more than one of, an alcohol would become a diol, right? Um, a di a dione is would be two ketones on the same molecule. A dioic acid is two acids on the same molecule. Um, although these ones really do tend to have common names because they show up a lot in biochemistry. So oxalic acid, malonic acid, succinic acid, glutaric acid. Um, I want to say um, tartaric acid, which gets used a lot. That's what tartar sauce is named for. Um, and yes, tartar, tartaric acid is a di dioic acid as well. It just also has these OH groups involved too. Um, so, if, and if you've ever done any any cooking with any recipes that call for um, like sodium tartrate, or I'm trying to think of what the name is in the in the kitchen for the, the deprotonated form. Um, but tartrate would be the deprotonated form of tartaric acid. 
Um, and then, like I mentioned, citric acid would be a is a tricarboxylic acid, a trioic acid. So again, we do see these happening, are um, showing up all over the place. So let's practice naming some of these. Well, and we're I'm not going to test you on if you can remember the um the common name for oxalic acid or what oxalic acid is. I'm we're just going to stick with the IUPAC names because we've spent so much time developing um, and getting used to that system. So why don't you why don't we try naming and drawing structures here? And I'll give you guys a few minutes, then we'll work through them. All right. So start start with a. Remember that it's a little bit tricky counting carbons when they're drawn in the condensed structure. Just remember that the carbons that are part of the carboxylic acid group still count as part of your primary carbon chain. Um, so if we look at a, we've got three CH2s in the middle and then an acid on either side. So it looks something like this. So that's going to mean our primary carbon chain is five carbons long. So it's going to be pentane dioic acid. And some, some um, textbooks will have you keep the E on pentane and keep it spelled just like pentane um, and pentane diol. And some will have you continue to drop the, the E. It doesn't really affect um, knowing what this molecule is. So I'm not going to be picky. Pentane dioic acid or pentane di dioic acid. I'm going to know what you mean either way, right? There's no way, there's still no way this can be misinterpreted. Um, so I'm not going to be picky about that, especially since there's a lack of, of consistency in the, in the field. Um, C. C6H5, CO2H, that's benzoic acid, right? Um, B, we've got four carbons in a row. 
uh, and only one acid. So that's going to be um, butanoic acid. Um, D is four carbons in a row with two acid groups. So that's going to be butane dioic acid. E is acetic acid or ethanoic acid. Acetic acid is probably the one where, and acetic acid and formic acid are probably the two where it's still more common to see the, the old school common name than it is to use the, um, the IUPAC name. When you get any bigger than acetic acid, it's way more common to just use the IUPAC name. Um, so it'd be ethanoic acid or acetic acid. And F would be either methanoic acid or formic acid. All right, so drawing the, the compounds from the name, again, I always found that to be easier because it kind of reminds you of the rules. Um, we'll go through a couple of these. So cyclobutane carboxylic acid, you can probably guess that even though we didn't specifically cover carboxylic acids attached to ring structures. Cyclobutane carboxylic acid is going to be cyclobutane attached to an acid group. Technically, you could also name that as cyclobutyl formic acid or cyclobutyl methanoic acid. Just treat the, the cyclo group as though it was a branch. Um, and if you do wind up with these running into these common names, um, that's what Moleview is for, right? That's why Moleview has a search function. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't waste time memorizing these names, at least until you, not until you get into when you, upper division biochem, um, at which point you probably will have to name, memorize the names and structures of the, of the Krebs cycle compounds and some of the more common, um, commonly occurring biochem molecules. Um, it doesn't make sense in, in this class to spend too much time memorizing what glutaric acid is. And if we wanted to do an IUPAC name for these others, my internet going, can you see it? There they go. Remember, just find your longest continuous carbon chain that ends in the acid group or begins in the acid group, really. And name the rest with, with branches. So this one's going to be one, two, three, four, five, six. So it's going to be hexanoic acid. And there's four methyl groups sticking off of it. So it's going to be tetramethyl hexanoic acid. And we would just name it. And with the acids, you don't have to specify that they're on carbon one because they're always on carbon one. They always have to be at the end of a carbon chain. So we'd name this what, three, three, four, four. Tetramethyl. Hexanoic acid. Right, so again, nothing we haven't seen before. We're just adding a new functional group to our vocabulary when it comes to nomenclature. B is a little bit tricky. 
and that your longest continuous carbon chain is not the carbon chain that starts with the acid. So you would want to name this as, what is that, one, two, three, four, five. So we would name this as a pentanoic acid with a propyl group, even though we could get seven carbons in a row if we just went left to right along the bottom. It has to be the longest continuous carbon chain with the acid. And we would want to make sure we specify two propyl pentanoic acid. If it's a dioic acid, then actually both ends of your carbon chain are already set. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so in that case, you really don't have any choice. If it's a dioic acid, you have to start on one acid group and end on the other acid group. All right, so any questions on nomenclature? It's kind of nice to use nomenclature as a little palate cleanser from all of our uh, from all of our reactions from the last chapter before we start adding re new reactions for this chapter, right? Nice to have that that safety blanket of I know I can at least get the nomenclature questions right. Um, in general, carboxylic acids are going to tend to melt and boil at pretty high temperatures. We've got um, we've got two within the same functional group, we have two polar bonds, very polar bonds. You've got an OH group, which is very polar. And you also have a carbonyl group, which is fairly polar. So carboxylic acids in general, because they have those very strong intermolecular forces, are going to have higher boiling points and higher melting points than other molecules of the same size. So for reference, um, Benzene has a very low melting point, boiling point. I think it boils somewhere like around 35 Celsius. Benzaldehyde, where you put an aldehyde group on there, we've added a polar group. So it's going to boil at higher temperatures, which is why it's got more of an essential oil sort of um, texture. So it's, it's almond extract is benzaldehyde. But it's, you can tell that it still evaporates pretty easily because you can smell it strongly. Anything you can smell strongly means that that's evaporating at least partially, right? It has a high vapor pressure. That's why you can smell it. Benzoic acid, not only does it, can you not smell it, it's actually a solid at room temperature. It's got a melting point somewhere around 60 Celsius. So just by adding that one extra OH group to go from benzaldehyde to benzoic acid, we dramatically increase the melting point and the boiling point. And we see this too with, with other uh, molecules that are roughly the same size. Um, it looks like I was not that far off on, on acetic acid. Acetic acid boils at um, 118 Celsius versus ethanol, which is approximately the same size, boils at 80 Celsius. Um, incidentally, this is one of the reasons why um, adding vinegar to a soup can make things cook faster because you're actually going to raise the boiling point of that whole mixture a little bit. And plus changing the pH can tenderize the meat a little bit more. Um, all right, so let's talk about why they're considered acids, why they're so acidic. Uh, it winds up being predominantly, it's not because they don't hold on to the hydrogen as strongly. It's more that when they're deprotonated, 
we can have some resonance happening because we can we can trade that negative charge back and forth between the two oxygens. They can each oxygen can take turns, um, giving you know, having the negative charge, and that makes the whole situation more stable than say deprotonating an alcohol. If you deprotonate an alcohol, then there's no resonance that can happen unless you're talking about a phenol. Right. Remember when we were we were talking about alcohols, we said, okay, well, phenol is is the exception, right? It, phenols are fairly acidic because you can resonate that charge throughout the benzene ring. Carboxylic acids are fairly acidic because you can resonate that charge between the two um, between the two oxygens. Right. Because in the resonance structure, if we were drawing the um arrows the mechanism to form it and i'm trying, waiting to see if my there it goes um we would see them look just like that and then our so then our resonance structure and remember that resonance arrows are a double-headed arrow and i will make that look cleaner since i'm trying to make a point about what the arrow looks like so this arrow on the left Remember, that's an equilibrium arrow. Arrow on the right is a resonance arrow. So the resonance structure would, we can't really tell the difference between the two oxygens, but we can still draw the resonance structure, which is just gonna look like you move the double bond down and the, the negative charge is on what was the carbonyl oxygen. Um, pKa for these is usually between four and five. And remember, pKa is the pH where we would expect them to be half, half deprotonated, where you would have equal amounts of the protonated and the deprotonated form. Um, and uh, if I'm remembering correctly, I think that the pKa for phenol, which you know I just used as an example of a, of a fairly acidic alcohol, um, phenol has a pKa around 10. So that's still fairly basic. It's still fairly hard to deprotonate phenol. But these carboxylic acids have P pKa's pretty, that are pretty acidic, um, which means it's easier to deprotonate them. When you can have them in that 50% protonated, 50% deprotonated equilibrium at a fairly acidic pH. So in general, the way we can use P pKa to, to um, judge qualitative, or I guess it is quantitatively, um, how acidic a molecule is, is higher pKa is gonna be more basic. A lower pKa is going to be more acidic. Um, and as you can see that as we, if you do add electron withdrawing groups, we're gonna make it more acidic. And the, the reasoning for that is basically that the more electron density you have on the, on the carboxyl oxygen, on the carboxylic acid oxygen, the tighter that proton is going to stick to it, right? Cause just cause you have a positive charge attracted to a negative charge. You have a pros if we can we can essentially think of these carboxylic acids as being the deprotonated form with a hydrogen stuck to the negative charge. So if you pull some of that electron density away, that hydrogen is not going to be stuck as tight. So more electron withdrawing means more acidic. Um, and you can see that it can be pretty dramatic just looking at acetic acid. Um, acetic acid has a pKa of 4.8. Adding a single chlorine to that acetic acid drops the pKa from 4.8 to 2.9. And remember, pKa is, is a log-based scale, right? So chloroacetic acid 
is a hundred times more acidic than regular acetic acid just by adding one chlorine. Um, and we can actually get, so trichloroacetic acid is actually almost as acidic as hydrochloric acid. It's almost a full on strong acid because you have pulled so much electron density away from that oxygen. Um, and I would wager actually, I know that trifluoroacetic acid is actually a fairly commonly used molecule. Let's see if there's a easy to find pKa. pKa is 0.5. So still not below zero. We still don't have something that we could consider a strong acid, but it's very acidic. Um, and it, that is a common enough compound that it shows up. You can buy it from Sigma. Sigma Aldrich is one of the primary um, chemical producers. And they've actually totally changed their website in the last year. Um, and so you can actually, if it's a common compound, you can buy it on Sigma. If you're going to buy a compound, Sigma will have it. There are other chemical producers, but Sigma is sort of like the, the Amazon. That's uh, not a great analogy. Um, it's uh, Sigma is usually the most expensive, but will have the highest quality and highest purity and also have the best selection. Um, so there are other chemical producers out there for, um, for labs, but Sigma is sort of the gold standard. Um, and in fact, you can buy you can buy just about any chemical you can think of, biological chemicals. You can buy cell cultures. You can buy drugs. Um, the problem is, is that the DEA tracks all of that, and Sigma won't send to you unless you are sending it to a school or a lab that they have on record. Um, so you can't just go on there and order lab-grade cocaine or something like that. Um, that's all still pretty highly regulated, um, or at least it is now. Not not so much back in the uh, in the sixties and seventies. All right. So a reminder how pKa works again. So if the pH is equal to the pKa, that means that you're going to have your deprotonated form and your protonated form in the same ratio, right? So remember this is our Henderson-Hasselbalch equation, um, or the, also called the buffer equation, which is just another way of rewriting our, our definition of an equilibrium constant, right? Ka equals the products over reactants. This should look very familiar to you, even if it's been a while, right? Even my, my bad handwriting notwithstanding. Um, all Ka is, is products over reactants for deprotonating a weak acid, right? So our products are the deprotonated, the conjugate base, the deprotonated form of the acid times H3O plus concentration, all of that divided by HA, the protonated form of your acid. If you just take the negative log of both sides of this and rearrange it a little bit, you get the Henderson-Hasselbalch equation. So it's barely a new equation, really. It's really the same equation with some algebra done to it to make it more useful for um, biochemists and organic chemists. So what this actually means, though, is that if we have the same amount of A minus and HA, this whole term, we, we would get that ratio would be one, right? And log of one is zero. So if pH equals pKa, that means by definition that your concentrations of the um, deprotonated form and the protonated form are equal, right? So that's a really good way to sort of delineate
between what form most of your acid is going to be in. Is it going to be more protonated or deprotonated? As if your pH is less than If your pH is less than pKa, pH being low means you have extra hydrogens around, right? If you have extra hydrogens around, it's going to be more likely that you're going to find your acid protonated. Just think of, think of it in terms of probability. If you have lots of H pluses bombing around and bouncing into stuff, there's a better chance that one of your deprotonated acids gets protonated. And vice versa, if pH is less than, or sorry, if pH is greater than pKa, we have fewer H pluses around which means you're more likely to be deprotonated because you're in more basic conditions. All right, so this allows us to predict a, a lot of things related to solubility as well, right? Because going from protonated to deprotonated is going to affect the charge. And if something's charged, it's gonna be more likely to be soluble in water. And if it's neutral, it's gonna be less soluble in water. So we can actually control whether or not a compound is dissolved in the nonpolar layer or a polar layer in the water layer just by controlling the pH. All right, so if we had acetic acid dissolved in a, in a solution with a pH of 5.76. And acetic acid, pKa is 4.8. It's 1.8 times 10 to the minus 5, and take the negative log of that. I know Ka, I haven't taught Gen Chem in a few, um, equilibrium in a few years, but I remember that one. Um, I believe it's going to be 4.8. I think that's what I had. Yeah, there we go. So if the solution has a pH of 5.76 and acetic acid's pKa is 4.8, what form is going to be more prevalent in the solution? The uh, deprotonated one? Deprotonated. We're more, we are more basic than the pKa. And we can actually solve the, and find the ratio. What is the ratio of deprotonated to protonated if we just solve for this term in this equation? Um, and I actually think that that 5.76, if I'm remembering correctly, the pK of acetic acid is 4.76. That's why 5.76 is a is a the number that they chose there. If we want to know what the ratio is of the protonated form to the deprotonated form, we just plug in the pH and the pKa and solve for the for that ratio. So 5.76 equals 4.76 plus log A minus over HA. So solving for that log, we're going to subtract 4.76 from both sides. We get 1, right? The 1 equals log of A minus over HA. Um, remembering that we're in, in, in the sciences, not engineering, and we're in the US, not in Europe, where log just mean, means natural log, unless you specify otherwise, this equation is log base 10. 
And so it's generally worth paying attention to that because some countries and some fields log means natural log, unless you specify otherwise. So that means if it's a log base scale and it's log base 10, one equals log there. How do we undo a log? It's log base 10. Somebody's in math, right? 10 to the power of that number. 10 to the power of that number. So we, we would wind up with 10 to the one and 10 to the log, those cancel out. So our ratio of A minus over HA equals 10. In other words, for every one protonated acid molecule, we have 10 deprotonated acid molecules. And you can see how with it being a log base scale, if the pH was 6.76, it'd be a 100 to 1 ratio. Every one pH unit you are off of the pKa is going to be a factor of 10 difference here. Um, and so generally, if we're trying to make sure that an acid or that a particular compound was soluble in the nonpolar layer or the polar layer, we would want to be at least two pH units off of um, the pKa because then we can sure we can be sure that 99% of our compound is either protonated or deprotonated, depending on what state we want it in. All right, let's take our break and we'll come back and we will do some ranking based on their acidity, based on what the structure and the electronegativity is. Um, we'll start working through back through these uh, at nine o'clock.
All right, let's start looking through these. So remember in our rule for determining acidity of a compound is based on the electron density around the acid group. So electron donating groups make it less acidic because extra electrons are gonna hold on to that H plus more. Electron withdrawing groups are going to make things more acidic because you're pulling electron density away from the H plus. Therefore, it's not as tightly attached. All right, so we've got butyric acids. We got three butyric acids. We have dimethyl, dichloro, and dichloro. So the dimethyl is going to be our least acidic. And again, with these rankings, it can get very, very confusing as to rank them in order of increasing acidity. Does that mean one is the most acidic or is one the least acidic? Um, just be clear on a test. If, if you're being asked a question like this, um, you don't even have to use the numbers. You can say most acidic, least acidic um, to make it explicitly clear. So you don't just wind up getting marked down on a technicality, um, at least on my tests. 3,4-dimethyl, so that's going to be our least acidic because we have two electron donating groups attached to the butanoic acid. 2,3-dichloro and 2,4-dichloro are both going to be in the same ballpark, but the one that has the, the uh, chlorines closer to the acid group is going to be a little bit more acidic. Right, because so we're basically to three dichloro looks like this to four yeah to four dichloro would put the second chlorine on the farthest carbon so it's going to be you're going to get less effect from that electron withdrawing for it being the same strength. At further away just means less effect, less effect of the um, electronegativity. And just a reminder that the electron density also applies to all of our NMR stuff that we were doing before, right? When we were talking about proton NMR and we would talk about shielding, shielding is another way of saying how much electron density something has. More shielded meant more electron density, less shielded or more deshielded meant less electron density. So it all comes back to electronegativity and resonance and electron density um, for your NMR stuff as well. That's why carboxylic acids and aldehydes had their protons show up way downfield in the proton NMR, right? Because they were most de-shielded protons. They had the least electron density. And again, don't worry that it's propionic acid. Propionic acid is just another way of writing propanoic acid. In fact, it's so, it's so common, I'm not sure why we still even write anything like this other than the fact that people have it in their stock rooms still um, labeled as propionic acid. Actually, I think in our stock room even, um, we have a bottle that's propionic acid. Um, we've got one bro or three bromo propionic acid. 2,2-dibromo, 3,3-dibromo. So the one that only has a single, yeah, I think, I think we do have a bottle labeled. Yeah, exactly. 3-bromo um, only has a single electron withdrawing group. All the other electron withdrawing groups are the same, right? It's not like we have a difference in electronegativity anywhere. So the only thing that's different about these is where the electron withdrawing groups are and how many there are. So our least acidic 
would be the three bromo. Then three three di bromo would be the mid. And our most acidic would be two two di bromo. Again, one in doubt, it all comes back to electronegativity and resonance. And those, and when we talked about our aromatic substitutions, we spent so much time talking about electron donating versus electron withdrawing because it shows up here too. Any, any groups that were electron withdrawing when it came to, um, when it came to talking about aromatics and aromatic substitution are also electron withdrawing here. So if we had a nitro group, if we had conjugated double bonds, those conjugated double bonds are going to make it electron withdrawing, which makes it more acidic. All right, so we have a few different ways we can, if we get into some reactions here, um, we have a few different methods for making carboxylic acids that we've already covered. For starters, we had, if, we, if you start with an alkyne and we do ozonolysis, that gives us a carboxylic acid, right? We've seen that one, we've used that one since last quarter. Um, we can also oxidize primary alcohols. You can't oxidize a secondary alcohol all the way to a carboxylic acid because that carbonyl in the middle of a carbon chain doesn't have a good leaving group that you could replace with, um, with an OH. So you can take a primary alcohol and, and oxidize it all the way to a carboxylic acid just by using dichromate. And then we actually we had this um, sort of this one didn't follow our normal rules. If you have an alkyl benzene, as long as that alkyl group has at least one hydrogen on the benzylic carbon, we could take that and we could oxidize it all the way to benzoic acid. And that just chops off the rest of the molecule and gets converted probably to CO2 probably wind up fully oxidizing the pieces that wind up getting broken off here. All right, so those we've all seen before. There are a couple other ways. And actually we saw this one just last chapter. We didn't go into detail on it, but remember, if we have a nitrile, um, we can convert that to a carboxylic acid just by exposing it to heat and acid. All right. So we we had this um, in the in the context of a cyanohydrin, right? Because we were using cyanide as our nucleophile to do an, a nucleophilic addition for a carbonyl. But it's cyanide is actually a pretty good nucleophile no matter what. So you can actually use this just as an SN2 reaction where you can basically you can replace a halide or any good leaving group with a cyanide group, which can then be oxidized to, um, to make a carboxylic acid. So this is actually a very convenient way of adding a single carbon. Um, if we want to turn it into a carboxylic acid. And actually, and then there's some things we can do. We can actually reduce that carboxylic acid then as well. So this winds up being a pretty useful nucleophile if we want to add just a single carbon to something. Um, and we can also actually just add CO2 to a Grignard reagent. If we have a Grignard reagent, Grignard reagents are pretty reactive, right? We had to be very, very careful with Grignard reagents not to have any water present because the water would react with the Grignard reagents. Um, if you take a Grignard reagent and instead of using, um, I guess you still are using the R group as a nucleophile. In this case, the R group is gonna act as a nucleophile and it's just gonna attack 
the carbon in a CO2. That carbon in a CO2 has a fairly strong partial positive on it, right? Because it's, it's like a double carbonyl. It's symmetric. The overall molecule is symmetric, but both oxygens are going to have a partial negative, which means you're going to have a partial positive on that carbon in the middle. So if you expose a Grignard reagent to CO2, you're going to wind up making a carboxylic acid. You're going to reduce that CO2 carbon and, and add it to your R group. Um, not great yields on that. And it winds up being really sort of inefficient, um, which is why we can't just use this. So from the context of climate change and understanding that CO2 is a problem in the atmosphere, there's a lot of different reactions that have been looked at, um, both as a way to try and turn atmospheric CO2 into a potential fuel to basically, um, um, it's referred to as carbon fixing, to try and reduce the carbon in CO2 and turn it into some sort of molecule that we can use that also won't be in the atmosphere. Um, so plants do this, they take CO2 and they turn it into sugar as a means of carbon fixing. So there, there have been lots of lab-based um, alternatives to photosynthesis that have, been, that have been suggested. And this would be one example. This is a carbon fixing reaction where we can wind up using up CO2 and turning it into something that we could use as a fuel potentially. Um, but it winds up being not very efficient in terms of the the amount of energy we have to put into it to make the Grignard reagent and then the overall yields as well wind up being pretty low. Um, so it's not an economical way to reduce CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, if we're talking about reactions that we can do once we have a carboxylic acid, the first reaction we learned for carboxylic acids was to reduce them. And remember, sodium borohydride was not strong enough. We had to use this super strength compound, a hydride source, lithium aluminum hydrides, um, is strong enough, a strong enough reducing agent that you can take a uh, carboxylic acid and convert it all the way back to a primary alcohol. Um, and that, that is our go-to for any carbonyl compound. Any carbonyl compound can be reduced by lithium aluminum hydride. Aldehydes and ketones, carboxylic acids, acid derivatives, they're all gonna wind up getting, getting reduced all the way to an um, alcohol. There is one other way, if we don't want to reduce every carbonyl, for instance, if we wanted to reduce the carboxylic acid without reducing a ketone or an aldehyde, we can actually use a reaction that uses um, borane, BH3, in, and remember that dot just means that THF is acting as a solvent, that's tetrahydrofuran. Um, which is a very slightly polar solvent that has a ketone in it. Um, furan looks like looks like this. Tetrahydrofuran, you break the pi bonds and you just wind up with a cyclopentyl that looks like this. So it's very slightly polar and it has properties of an ether. Um, I was wrong, it does not have the ketone. Tetrafuran is the cyclic ether, not ketone. Um, so THF is being used in this case, just as the solvent, since ethers are less reactive. Um, in this case, you will reduce the acid without reducing any class two carbonyls that you have. 
All right, so in terms of synthesis, if, if we wanted to make a molecule that left a carbonyl in one spot, but we wanted to get rid of the acid, this would be a very useful way to do that. All right, so now that we've covered how we can either make a carboxylic acid or get rid of a carboxylic acid, make a carboxylic acid through oxidation, we get rid of a carboxylic acid through reduction. Um, the bulk of these reactions, most of what the reactions that carboxylic acids go through are actually just converting from one, um, one form of an acid derivative, one class one carbonyl to another. So remember that a class one carbonyl meant it had a good leaving group, right? So a anything that has a good leaving group attached to a carbonyl um, could conceivably be used. And you can kind of convert back and forth between these, these five uh, functional groups. Um, carboxylic acids, acid halides, acid anhydrides, esters, and amides are all pretty easy to convert back and forth between. Um, and if you look at the carbonyl carbon on each of these, your good leaving group on each of them is more electronegative than carbon is, right? That's part of what makes it a good leaving group, um, which means all of these carbonyl carbons are the same oxidation state. So we're not really oxidizing or reducing anything when we're switching between these acid derivatives because the carbon has the same, the same oxidation state before and after all these reactions. So it's really sort of mixing and matching. You can mix and match any, any more electronegative element than carbon in here and attach it and you're gonna get an acid derivative. <coughs> Um, these are the most common ones, but there are acid derivatives that involve sulfur being attached. There are acid derivatives. Um, for instance, your, your amide can have another R group attached to it. That's actually what a peptide bond is, right? Um, in biochemistry is, is an amide functional group where you've got two different R groups on either side. Um, nitriles technically, they're not considered acid derivatives, but they do have the same oxidation state. Um, and we can convert a nitrile into a carboxylic acid, as we saw a few slides ago, right? Um, so they're not grouped into that same category of acid derivatives, but they, they do share some similar reactions. Um, they're just not as easy to convert back and forth between. Um, we're going to go through these acid derivatives and name them, um, do the nomenclature for them, because it turns out they're all going to be pretty related. Um, for the most part, you're going to start by naming them as the acid. Um, so at ACL halides, you name them as an acid, and then just instead of saying ic acid, you put YL at the end and then say what the, the uh, halide is. So acetic acid becomes acetyl bromide. You have acetyl chloride as well. Benzoic acid becomes benzoyl chloride. Um, if we had something larger, we could have butanoyl chloride would be four carbons long. So if you remember the basic structure of these acid derivatives, a lot of times the name will kind of has the information you need to pick which of those you're talking about. Um, if you have an anhydride, an anhydride, you just put an, the word anhydride instead of acid. Acetic anhydride means that you've replaced the H with another acetate molecule, basically. So these anhydrides 
have this really characteristic structure where it's carbonyl, oxygen, carbonyl. And your leaving group is basically everything to the right of the um of that line. So you've basically replaced an OH with a whole nother acetate molecule. Um, and so generally, these are going to be symmetric. You're going to have the same thing on both sides of the of the anhydride. And so you just name it as though you were naming the acid. Acetic acid becomes acetic anhydride. Succinic acid becomes succinic anhydride. Um, and if it's a long enough dioic acid, sometimes these anhydrides wind up forming these, these ring structures. Um, we see that a fair bit with um, biological molecules. And we don't see the anhydrides are unstable enough. We don't see them forming in cells, um, but a lot of these dioic acids wind up um, being able to turn them into anhydrides, which is useful in certain synthesis reactions because they're very reactive molecules in general. Um, if we do have an asymmetric anhydride, you just name both sides of it as though they were the acid. And you just stick them those terms together. So acetic benzoic anhydride. Acetic acid would be if you protonated the part that I circled in blue. Benzoic acid if you, would be if you protonated the section that I circled in red. So if it's the anhydride, you just call you just name both of them together. Um, and those are unusual enough that in general, you don't even need to worry about um, you don't need to worry about saying you don't say diacetic anhydride. If you just say acetic anhydride, it's assumed that you're talking about the symmetric anhydride. Um, amides are named by sticking on the suffix amide to the end. Um, and you just drop the ic acid and replace it, replace it with amide. So acetic acid becomes acetamide. Benzoic acid becomes benzamide. Um, and anything that we have attached to the nitrogen that's not part of our longest continuous carbon chain because the nitrogen is not a carbon, right? So instead of numbering any branches that are attached to the nitrogen, we just use letter N instead of a number to say what, what they are. So for instance, we had this compound. If we were naming it as the acid, ignoring the, if you, we, in our minds, replace the nitrogen with an OH, that would be butanoic acid. So that's going to be butanamide. And we have one branch attached to the, um, attached to this molecule that's not part of that butanamide structure because our, our primary molecule, our parent molecule is this, that's butanamide. If we have a branch attached to it, we would name it with a suffix or with a prefix. So it'd be methyl butanamide. But we can't just use a number because that methyl group is not attached to a carbon. It's not attached to one of the four carbons on our carbon chain. So say N-methyl butanamide. Right. And so that's, I guess that's why the, the reason why they say you don't just use a number to define where something is. They call it a locant because sometimes the locant is um, not a number. In this case, it's it's the N. Um, and if you, you can actually have molecules that have more than one nitrogen, 
and you could have things attached to both nitrogens and those you'd say N and N prime usually, the um, numerical prime, it's just an apostrophe, that'd be N prime. Um, if you're trying to say that you had a, a methyl group on two different nitrogens, you, you could write it that way. I don't think we'll see any examples like that yet. Maybe when we get to the chapter on amines. All right, and last but not least are esters. And esters are named, we name it just like it's the deprotonated acid. And then we name whatever's on the other side of the ester as a prefix. So acetic acid, if it was deprotonated, we'd name that acetate. So we wind up saying acetate, say it's the deprotonated form, and then we say ethyl acetate. And so we have to be careful with this to, to differentiate between something that's a branch attached to our acid molecule and something that's on the other side of the ester. And so they're um, very, very careful to put a space in between these. The space indicates that the ethyl is on the other side of the ester, not a branch on the parent molecule. So for instance, If we had a benzoic ester, actually, let's erase that one for now. So for starters, we would name this by saying, okay, let's look at this. Let's find the acid group, so the, the part of the carbonyl part of the molecule that has the carbonyl on it is the acid molecule, right? So if you just, if you removed that methyl and just had the part that I circled in red, that would be the deprotonated benzoic acid, right? So the deprotonated name for the benzoic acid is benzoate. And then to indicate that it's an ester as a separate word, you would write methyl benzoate. And to give you an idea of why we need to be careful that it's a separate word, What if I added a methyl to the benzene as well? So now our parent molecule is methyl benzene, ben, sorry, methyl benzoate, then it has a methyl on the other side. So we wouldn't name this dimethyl because we have the methyls are on separate parent molecules. Our parent molecule, we're gonna name this whole thing around, would be, let's see, one, two, three, be four methyl benzoate, all written as one word or with hyphens. And if I want to say what's on the other side of the ester, that's a separate word. So we'd say methyl, four methyl benzoate. Right, the fact that we're writing all of this as one word tells us that the four methyl is applying to the benzoate. And the fact that we're writing the first methyl as a separate word is telling us it's applying 
It's describing the other side of the ester. Right, so a subtle distinction, but one that winds up being important sometimes. Um, and you can wind up with, with di, diesters. Um, diesters, you would just name as a separate word both of the pieces that are on the other side of the ester. So you could have diethyl um, malinate. Um, and when I said diesters, that might have sounded odd to you. Um, this That's actually... Um, where the term polyester comes from. Polyester is a polymer made up of a whole bunch of esters linked together, where you have esters linking your monomer units. So polyester, the fabric, is it's known as a synthetic fabric, right? Because it's a, it's a plastic, the polymer that's made, and polyester actually is the scientific name for that type of, of polymer. So for once, um, pop culture and uh, the world at large got their chemistry term right. All right, so that was a whole bunch of, voc of um, nomenclature that I threw all at once. So let's practice with it. I'll give you guys five minutes, head start, and I'll start working through these. All right, so 
grant, given that we have so many functional groups these days and remembering how to name them can be a bit of a chore, um, it's time to refer back to one of my favorite chemistry blogs. Uh, remember compound chemistry? Compound chemistry has all sorts of good infographics. Um, uh, we've used them for IR spec and NMR. They have a really good one that's just a good cheat sheet for functional groups in or inorganic chemistry. Um, and all of our carbonyl compounds are right here in green in the middle. And they have the, if you know your IUPAC rules in general, um, it's got the a short little cheat sheet for how to name them as well. Um, and so for anything that you don't remember, and I'll put this on um, this week's overview as well as a uh, resource, it would not be a bad thing to have in front of you when you were taking a test, right? Um, since you don't need, you probably don't need the um, super in-depth how to name everything since we have most of our rules memorized at this point, but just to remember um, some of the more specific things. Um, and, and they even have imines and nitriles on here too. Um, so if we're trying to name some of these, um, and that the I got to that page just by Googling compound chemistry functional groups as the first res first result that comes up. But then again, I'll post a link with a PDF that you can use as well. Um, so if we have an anhydride, anhydride is two acid molecules that are linked at the oxygen, right? So A, is going to be, it's a three carbon long acid molecule that's linked, right? So this would be propanoic anhydride. We look at B, it's an amide. And remember the cart where the carbonyl is, is going to determine your parent molecule for all of these, especially for the amides and the esters where you can have something attached on the other side of the, of the functional group. You're looking for the carbonyl to determine your parent molecule. So our parent molecule for B is gonna be propanamide. And we have our branches are benzenes. And remember the prefix for a benzene is phenyl with a Y. So this is gonna be N, N, diphenyl, propanamide. Again, and I'm, I'm reiterating this um, because I remember first learning about esters and being having a really hard time um, remembering which side was supposed to be the parent molecule. Um, I remember looking at esters and not knowing which side was supposed to be the one that was considered the primary side for naming these. So I'm spending a lot of time to emphasize it's the side with the carbonyl because that's the piece that looks like it's an acid, right? So this would be butanoate would be the parent molecule. And then separate word, Propyl.
And just as a something I meant to mention earlier, but I forgot. Um, this molecule at the bottom left, ethyl acetate or ethyl ethanoate would be the IUPAC name for it. Um, that's actually um, non, non acetone nail polish remover is ethyl acetate. Um, and one of the reasons that they do that is one, it doesn't evaporate quite so easily as acetone, but it dissolves, dissolves things almost as well as acetone does. And the fact that it doesn't dissolve as e easily means that you don't wind up um, losing as much to evaporation or um, breathe, inhaling nearly as much of it because acetone is a carcinogen. Um, and it also smells better. Acetone's got that really harsh chemically smell to it. Um, ethyl acetate, esters in general tend to have a, a somewhat sweet smell. Um, a lot of esters get produced as, a bypro as byproducts of fermentation um, and of other biological processes. So a lot of times um, esters wind up being preferable as a solvent um, when possible, if they will still do the same um, reactions or same solubility that you need them to, you'll wind up using an ester instead of acetone. And in fact, um, a lot of artificial fruit flavorings are just esters um, that you know, that really, really kind of artificial candy taste of um, fake banana that uh, is, you know, probably what gives banana boat sunscreen its smell, um, but definitely like the, the taste of banana in like runts um, is, uh, I want to say it's isoamyl acetate is the name of the compound. It's basically a pentol, a pentol acetate or pentol propanoid, I can't remember which. Um, and, but if you switch a couple atoms around, you get artificial strawberry flavor or artificial mango flavor. Most artificial flavors are just a simple ester. Um, this one's one that we can tell it's an anhydride but we might want to double check if there's a common name for this one. Um, if we we're naming it the IUPAC name, we would look at it and say, well, it's, it's an acid molecule that's four carbons long, right? So it'd be butane di dioic acid would be when it was in the acid form. And if it's in the anhydride form, it would be butane dioic anhydride. I believe that that's succinic anhydride that we succinate is the four carbon dioic acid that we had on the last page. And so I believe that that was succinic anhydride. The other really, which is a pretty common one. Um, the other really common uh, one is uh, maleic anhydride. So maleic acid um, turned into an anhydride. We see that a fair bit in, in synthesis. All right, we have another dioic acid, actually the same dioic acid, right? It's still a four carbon dioic acid. So we would either wanna look up what that structure was, the four carb carbon dioic acid, or name it butane dioic acid. If it was, if we named it as butane dioic acid, we would be dropping the ick and adding the eight for it to be deprotonated, right? So it would be, butane dioate. And we start winding up with these words that we well, wind up with lots of vowels in a row. It don't seem like they should be real words, um, but we're following our rules. Butane dioate. And then we would name both of the, the other side of each ester. So both of these esters have a methyl on the other side. So a separate word. 
dimethyl butane dioate. And, I, and like I said, I believe that's succinic acid. So the other name for it would be dimethyl succinate. To double check that, we can throw it into Moldview. And in fact, as soon as my, that's what we had, right? And Moldview is not quite as good at, I, at some of the complicated IUPAC names, but we should be able to put in butane dioic acid, it's dioate as well, dimethyl butane dioate, and get the same molecule. Um, but I'm not going to test that right now. So we'll continue working on this. D is a tricky one. How did we name an acid when it was attached to an alkyl group? A, a um, cyclogroup. Cyclogroups like a substituent? To like cyclogroups. Is sub yeah, cyclobutyl or even cyclobutane. And then we just use the word carboxylic, carboxylic acid. Um, in this case, we're just going to, instead of saying the name of carboxylic acid, this is an amide, right? So cyclobutane amide cyclobutanamide and then we would just name the suffix um the um other branches here by saying n all right so what i'm going back to is all the way back when we were naming our acids where did they go This one, cyclobutane carboxylic acid. Um, so we would just say cyclobutane and then say the name of our functional group. And again, anything that's attached to the nitrogen, we use N as the locant for those branches. So N-methyl, N-ethyl. Let's look at H and I, because this is the key figuring, remember figuring out which is the, the acid molecule for our base molecule is the trick here. So it can be helpful to circle the part that has the carbonyl attached to it. Name that as the acid, as the deprotonated acid, so as the eight, and then add what's on the other side. So the one on, on the left would be methyl benzoate. And the one on the right, the parent molecule is going to be acetate or ethanoate. And so we have methyl benzoate on the left and phenyl ethanoate on the right. Right, so again, the carbonyl controls that. Pay attention to where the carbonyl is for your esters especially. And this is just good test taking strategy. If you can't remember how to name a certain molecule here, go to the other section where I have you drawing the structure for a given name and see if there's something in the name that triggers you remembering what the rules are. And same for standardized tests too. If you can't remember the rules for naming, 
go through the rest of the test and see if you see another molecule that has something similar that's, that they give you the name for. Right? Use the test against itself to sort of trigger your memory where necessary. Just don't forget to go back and fill it out later. Um, so, for instance, phenyl cyclopentane carboxylate. If we had forgotten how to name something that was attached to a cyclo group, this is a good re uh, reminder. Cyclopentane carboxylate. is going to look like that. Then phenyl as a separate word means you've got a benzene ring attached. All right. We're almost done with today's lecture. We'll stop there um, and we'll pick it back up on Tuesday. Uh, later today, once I've proofed it and, and updated it from last year, I'll get you guys a practice test for the midterm. And that'll be your assignment over the weekend. Instead of doing quiz, do the practice test. And we'll be able to go over um, any questions you have either on Tuesday or during the review on Thursday. Sean, can you make that do like Monday night or Tuesday? Okay. Yeah, no, I, I think I'll probably make it due on, on Thursday when you guys take the test, but just know that it's in place of the quiz, so I want you to be working on it and studying over the weekend, um, but it won't be due until the test. Okay, and I, I thought I saw that the exam was on Tuesday for some reason, but maybe that's... Let's see. Let's double check. Just a um, function. That's what I saw. Yes. Let me pull up the schedule and I distracted myself there as well. Um, so we will talk about finding your research papers next week in lab since this week we spend it on synthesis and review. Um, let's just double check this. I It just says so that the so this is going to be, um, I need to update this a little bit. We will not be doing the, the exam in lab. We will be doing the exam sometime between Thursday and Sunday, like we've, like we've discussed. So thanks for bringing that up. Um, I will make sure that, the, that um, in lab, we're just going to be talking about either just reviewing and talking about your, your research papers that you guys are supposed to be finding. Uh, or that that I'll tell you how to find, um, since we haven't really talked about that at all yet. All right, so don't stress about that. This schedule all needs to be updated. I'll get you the practice test, and the, practice, and the test will start next Thursday, and you'll have all weekend to finish it up. All right, well, everybody have a good weekend. Um, and uh, watch for that announcement that and uh, and assignment for the for the uh, practice test. Say bye to everybody, Valence. Bye bye.